So the first thing you need to do is figure out what you want to sacrifice. If you can't figure out how to find your four hours a day, then it's going to be pretty hard to get in. People have been doing it for tens of thousands of hours. They're going to get a job ahead of you. You need to catch up with the person who has that 10,000 hours. And so whether you do 10 minutes a day or four hours a day, you're going to have to find the time and do it consistently to build up enough clout and skill to be able to do it. Hello, my name is Mr. Tom Froze, and these are my thoughts on illustration. This is a bi-weekly podcast about showing up and growing up as an illustrator. Welcome to episode 26. So today, for the first time in the short history of this podcast, I have a guest. I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with picture book illustrator and self-described 10-minute artist Adam Ming. Stick around if you want to be fired up by one of the most inspiring, enthusiastic illustrators I know. In our conversation, Adam shares his thoughts on transitioning to illustration when he was almost 40. He shares his thoughts on pivoting from an aspiring comic artist to a picture book illustrator. And he'll also share some thoughts on the explosive growth that can come from being part of a dedicated community of artists. He also surprised me by what he means by giving this illustration thing a shot. And let's just say it's not just spending six months or a year trying to do this. It's much longer. I'll let you listen to the episode to find out how long that actually is for Adam. Now, before we get into it, I just want to share some thoughts on the fact that this is my first official interview for this podcast, and I'm really just learning how to do this thing. So where it comes to having guests on this show, I don't see myself as an interviewer in the most traditional or formal sense. My vision for these conversations is more like a conversation between two creatives, while at the same time, I want to make sure that I'm shining the light on my guest as as much as possible. So I think in an interview, normally it's all questions from your host and all the answers come from your guest but here it's a little bit more give and take and sometimes as in the case of this first interview or conversation Adam will say something it'll trigger a thought in me and I'll riff on that a bit myself. Now the thing that I'm most interested in picking at with my guests is in what fuels them up and keeps them going both in the everyday practical sense like how do you stay motivated but also in the sense of what drives them at a much deeper level. So we covered so much in this conversation, but I still feel like we really only scratched the surface. I'm finding so far that my biggest challenge is to steer the conversation to like give it a direction without bulldozing through some of the amazing nuggets that my guest drops along the way. You know, an hour goes by so fast, so I see it as my job as a host to make sure we stay on track and I at least extract some kind of continuous, cohesive thread from my guest. But I also want the conversation to flow organically. So that's something I'm going to be learning how to do as I go. Another challenge that I have, and this isn't just as a podcast host, but in general, is just having a smoother, more flowy conversation with whoever I'm talking to. And I know that I'm not unique in this. It might be because I'm an introvert. It might be because I'm a bit of a slow thinker. So kind of quickly coming back with the next right thing to say to keep the conversation moving isn't my strong suit. But I truly believe that good conversations can happen between people regardless of their having the best possible conversation skills. 
So in this episode, it is a bit of a dare for me, like I'm daring myself to leave in some of my more awkward moments when I didn't know exactly how to move us from one point to the next. Sometimes I make a bad joke or I say a thought that's kind of random. And even though I edited out the worst of it, I wanted to leave some of those moments in partly because it keeps the conversation feeling natural, but also because I don't want to hide all the warts here. I want to be authentic and make this feel like a real conversation that shows and reflects my level of experience as a a host doing these interview type conversations. In the future, I want to be able to look back on this episode and say, my goodness, I've grown a lot. I've gotten a lot better at this. So here's to starting out feeling like a beginner all over again and being okay with that. All that aside, I'm actually pretty proud of this episode and I'm excited to share the conversation with you in a few moments. So now just some of the usual stuff. I just want to take a moment to thank you for being here. I especially want to thank my supporters on Patreon who truly help make this podcast possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, if you're a fan of Thoughts on Illustration, I want to give you three ways you can support this podcast. The first two are free and super easy to do, and the third might actually help you level up in your creative journey. First, you can share this episode or this podcast with your friends. And this is actually the best way to help a podcast grow. There are probably a gazillion podcasts out there. And by recommending thoughts on illustration to your friends, they will be way more likely to listen to this podcast. And if I'm doing my job right, I like to believe that they'll probably thank you for the tip. The second way you can support the podcast is by following or subscribing to the podcast wherever you happen to be listening from. Thoughts on Illustration is available on almost all podcast platforms, maybe all of them. I don't know how many there are out there. My simple cast thing broadcasts it to all the things. So whether you're on Spotify, Google, Apple, or YouTube even, you'll find me there as an audio podcast. So the third way you can support this podcast is by joining as a drawing buddy on Patreon. For $8 a month, you get exclusive access to my live monthly drawing meetups called Draw With Me. You'll also get a 20% discount on my one-on-one coaching sessions. Join today at patreon.com slash Tom Froze. So just a quick intro to my guest today before we get into it. Adam Ming is a startup co-founder turned picture book illustrator. He's based in Malaysia. He makes witty, soulful illustrations with a comic sensibility. His picture books include Down the Hole, Does a Monkey Get Grumpy, and Where Are You Really From, among others. His clients include HarperCollins, Bloomsbury, Hardy Grant, and Scholastic. Adam is also the founder of The 10-Minute Artist, where he shares strategies and steps to help you break into children's publishing. All right, let's get into the episode. So my main focus for you really is how I see you, and this is just how I see you, and we can talk about it, but I see you as a, a late bloomer in the career sense, a late blooming illustrator. And I think that you're a great example of someone who started late and found success. You're doing the thing. That's a good definition of success, doing the thing, because there are levels to success, obviously. And if doing the thing is, is what we consider success, then I'm definitely successful. And that's how I feel as well. Absolutely. I, I mean, there's, everyone has a different idea of what they consider success too, right? Yeah. Uh, But what I see, like the way that I see you as a success from my perspective is that you 
are you you are working right now as a kids book illustrator and that was your goal yeah when we talked uh, probably two years ago for the first time when yep. when i started doing these coaching call type things on patreon i believe you were my first or one of my first uh i guess people to do that with and i i don't know i can't remember exactly how far along you were but you were much earlier and so i've seen you really blossom to go along with this late blooming uh analogy i've seen you really blossom into this illustrator who's doing lots of kids books and um you're part of groups like illo guild kind of just really in it yeah. and i think just just the fact that you're a success story in this sense i i just know that there are a lot of people who listen to this podcast people who have coached people who take my classes a lot of people are switching from some previous thing mm. into illustration a lot of people are finding illustration later in their journey they're not coming out of art school at you know 19 years old 20 years old and they know right away what they're doing so yep. that's kind of the 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 area that i want to poke around at yep. and how would you describe yourself right now in terms of what you do i would say like you said i'm living the dream or i'm successful in the sense that i'm doing what i want to be doing and i think that's that's so precious and so valuable and what that is is i i looked at my calendar exactly half the days in the year i've committed to illustrating picture books and i've already signed up for i'm signed up for work for exactly half the year and for the other half the year well, one of my goals this year is to take 52 Sundays off, so take every Sunday off. So you can imagine that for the first two years, I didn't take a day off or hardly took a day off. Maybe I was sick a couple of times, but other than that, it's... I mean, when you're doing the thing that you love to do, you, you can't really conceive of taking the day off, but one of my goals this year is to take 52 days off. That leaves about 50-something days, and that's for my Substack, which is a lot of things. Um, it's just a creative expression and that's a longer term goal I have that maybe in 10 years, well, exactly in 10 years, eight years now, two years have gone by, that the Substack would take care of the the needs financially and then like doing a book is something optional. Like I can do less books and spend a lot more time. Yeah, just spend a lot more time to see it more as an art project but this is a commercial project. Right. Does that make sense? You know, absolutely it makes sense. I mean, I think that's the ideal situation with books because it allows you to pour yourself into each illustration, each page, and really consider it a work of art, which a kid's book, I don't want to say should be, but it's a, it's, I think that's a very lofty goal for... Yeah that it, it i mean as an illustrator you're an artist and the kids book is one of the most coveted canvases for your art they can this can certainly be a form of art they not always are okay okay um we can pick at that maybe <laughs> uh later you know um this idea of like when or when is not a book a work of art but okay um, you say half of your days are devoted to picture books, working on yes. picture books, half yes. of the year. Uh, I'm trying to do the math here. So that's, you know, half of 365. And then the other half, part of that is your 52 Sundays off. And then around 50 days, you're working on your, your sub stack. Uh, yep. Is there any other days left over that you're doing something else? Uh, I, I, again, I feel like 50 plus 52 is almost the balance of half of the year. What else are you doing? That's it, basically. I That's have it. a okay. toddler, so my, my days yeah. are built around her. Yeah, There's a huge chunk in the middle of the day where I spend taking my kid to the gym and swimming and, and different activities throughout the week. So mm -hmm. I, I typically work in the mornings. And then I have another session in the evening. And that's how I've structured it for this year. Okay. 
and it keeps changing as the toddler grows their schedule changes and mine changes around that and that's part of what I consider being successful because that was the goal the purpose of becoming an illustrator was to have this kind of flexibility to design the days the way you want them to be kind of live okay. life on your own terms of course I mean that's the the kind of freelance ideal right yeah. whether you're whatever it is that you're doing the idea is that you're in control of your schedule how how much actual control have you felt over your schedule in reality it's I think this year is the first year I have a sense of control the past two years have been and the past two years being the first two years getting into this I spent two years before that trying to get in and I kind of broke broke in a couple of years ago uh -huh. and that has been pretty much a huge learning curve so whenever I have work I just work all the time Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are, there are gaps, but you don't know when the gaps are. And the gaps might be when the clients are reviewing the work and maybe someone's on holiday and things like that. Yeah. So there'll be gaps, but you wouldn't really know what to do with those gaps. You just kind of fill them up. The Substack thing is actually one of the things that stood out to me about you way back before many people even knew what Substack was. You were trying to get me on board to Substack. I was. I think when I was starting... I haven't given up, though. <laughs> sure. Like, uh, I, I, I have my own feelings about that whole model. Um, yeah. a, a little bit... Uh, I'm a little bit critical of it. Not not of what you're doing. Uh, I think, uh, like, and, and it's not necessarily a universal thing. It's more about, like, what I think I just feel good feel excited about doing with with my time but Ooh. way back when i started my i must have been it might have been when i was writing a lot more on medium and it might have been also around when i was doing my my uh, patreon stuff just starting out with that you were talking about the Substack thing and it was very abstract to me but now everybody knows about Substack, and in 2024 i feel like Many of us who are illustrators for a living, we're looking for that extra income, whether it's whether you want to call it passive income, whether you want to call it, uh, I don't know, just enough to, to, to support our illustration habit. And so you kind of answered one of the questions I had, and it's about how you see that as a source of revenue. Your goal is for your sub stack to be your major source of income so that you can spend more time, it, like so you can basically have the luxury of doing your books in your time, in your way. So why Substack? Why, why is that for you the thing? So first of all, I don't think Substack in itself is the thing, mm -hmm. but the thing is having a direct connection with an audience and direct connection means you can give them value and they can compensate you for that value. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, Substack is the most straightforward way to do that. Mm -hmm. So like I mentioned earlier, I just did a workshop and rather than set it up on some other platform, it's just part of my Substack offering. And I have different offerings. So my Substack is actually a collection of offerings and it's a little bit of an experimentation, especially in the past two years. But this year, I'm pretty clear because I've clearer who the audience are and what they want and what I can contribute to them. So this year, I've set out the plan for the whole year, like what value I can give to the audience. And I'm just going about executing that plan. So that's one of the things that's given me a lot more control, you asked earlier. So it gives me a lot of control in the sense that I'm not thinking every day, like, what am I going to create? I have a plan. Mm -hmm. And all I need to do throughout the year is execute that plan. But why Substack? So I'm going to rewind a bit. Like before I even wanted to be a picture book illustrator, my dream job, because it's really about what is success. Mm -hmm. And being the picture book illustrator was not my first version of what success looks like. I really wanted to be a cartoonist. And what I like about cartoonists is I know that if I spend like five hours a day, and I think that's my capacity, I can like concentrate and make something good for about five hours a day, I can come up with something like a comic strip. Okay. And so my deep, my dream job is to contemplate life generally 
and mm-hmm. then put that into some sort of art form, ideally comics. The trouble with comics, though, is it's a dying medium as far as I can tell. Oh. Like the people who do pay you for comics, they're not as many and they don't pay you as highly as other industries. Uh Ideally, you'd want to be a syndicate cartoonist and less and less people read newspapers. Uh So that option is a shrinking option. Whereas I notice in my bookshop, the children's book section keeps growing from two shelves to four shelves to six shelves. So that's a growing market. Right, right. Okay, so you kind of had to pivot from what your dream was because you saw the writing on the wall for comics, which is kind of your first yep. your first love there. And I think the comics is just a clue. So I think you have an intuition of what you want to do. But really the thing mm. I wanted to do is live like a cartoonist, mm. which is to spend every day producing a an amount of work putting it into a container Uh. and then shipping it off. So that's why Substack. Substack is something like that. Yeah. Like to have an audience that you can spend five hours on daily and then ship it off and get fairly compensated for that. Mm -hmm. So I'd still be living that cartoonist lifestyle, making art for my people. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason for that, that direct relationship. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I can see the, the parallels between having a substack, which is a sort of syndication model. You're creating content yep. every day as your daily expression, in a sense, which is what a, a, a comic is, uh, or a cart- uh, a, like a, let's say, a four panel comic, as you say, contemplating life. You can contemplate life through the lens of an illustrator, do that through your substack build up a community around that and that's kind of like your 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 how you're able to earn from that i yep. think i think that's great and i mean all of this shows that that sort of entrepreneurial side that you have and that's at the kind of at the core of how you probably started this whole thing but before we get too far away from this topic i i, I was just curious about this idea of planning uh a year ahead and having a plan for how you do your sub stack, like what does that look like? Um, sure. And and personally, like I I would have a hard time creating a plan that's very regimented for the entire year ahead. Uh, what is it? Is is it like a goal that you have, or is it very specific? And every like you've al- allocated time in a specific way. Like, what does that plan look like? It's very specific because you need to tell the audience what they're going to get so that you can illustrate the value that they're going to get for subscribing. And some people subscribe for a year. So I think it's only fair to let them know what they're going to be getting for a year. And a lot of people do like a patron kind of model. They say like, let me tell you my musings on life, which is basically what I'm trying to do. But if you don't package those musings into the value Uh that someone's going to get out of it, then it, you're just kind of run of the mill. Every illustrator is going to like, okay, let me tell you about my life as an illustrator. Yeah. And they all pretty much say the same thing. And to be honest, I am saying the same thing, but I'm packaging it in a way where people can see the value more directly because okay. all, all anyone really cares about is themselves. And so I'm telling my same story in the lens of what's valuable to them. And that's really what the plan is about creating these containers, um, I'll segue to say that the meaning of... Are you familiar with the with the origins of the word comic or cartoon? I am not. So I believe it's a French origin, origin and cartoon is actually a play on the word carton, which is basically a container. Okay. So a cartoon is actually a container for art. Okay. Like the box. In that sense, what I'm creating are, are boxes. It's more abstract than that, but yeah. I'm creating boxes to, to put these ideas into. But it wasn't easy. I started thinking about this in March, the previous year, because I had been writing my experiences about breaking into the industry. And it's very exciting in the beginning because I went from trying to break in to breaking in. But now it's just work. Mm-hmm. So there's there's nothing left to say almost. I can keep going back and saying the same things. Work hard. But yeah. But now it's just let's say 
it's just work. So I need a new topic. Yeah. And yeah, so I'm trying to abstract out my experiences, but present it in a way that's valuable to people. So I had to figure out what what's valuable, what can I give people and who my audience are which you learn as you build up an audience and you speak to them, you kind of know who they are, where they're at, and what what they're there for. They they tell you what they're there for. So some people are trying to break in. That's the smaller audience. But mm-hmm. some people are just interested. Interested in what? Interested in art, maybe. And they just don't know what's the next step. Maybe they have a job, maybe they're an accountant, or they did art for a while and their parents made them go to some other feel but they're still interested and they just don't know where to start and for me the starting point is drawing for 10 minutes a day okay just creating that space the carton that they can start to fill and if you keep filling maybe that space grows Uh and that's just how I started as well so so those are those are two audiences one is the people who who have no idea where to start and so my recommendation is to spend 10 minutes a day sketching yeah and then the people trying to break in where I share, like, not just work hard, but some strategies to work smart. And we can talk about some of those later. And the last thing is not not burning out. So these are the things I try to share. So strategies to work smart. I love that. Uh, and I would... That's part of breaking in. Yeah. And then the 10 minute stuff. Yeah. And then what was that? What was the, the last one that you just said? Not burning out. Not burning out. Also very because important. Because it's all good to work hard. But yeah. So so these are the things I thought. The last one is, is for myself. It's like what I'm trying to figure out as I go, but to do it with an audience. So what my plan looks like now is I have a weekly project, which I, which is a short lesson in the form of an email and then a sketchbook challenge related to that lesson. And so this goes on throughout the year. So you might read it and... It might interest you when you do it for a week and the next week might not interest you so you skip it and you take the following one but you take a look what's the lesson and what's the challenge and you can either take the lesson or the challenge or both Mm -hmm. so that's the that's the main free thing and almost everything else okay so that's always free free. the the lesson and the challenge are always free so what is what is um, paid so what's paid is like art gym which is once a month, we do an art workshop. It's similar to the email where there's a lesson at the beginning and then we draw uh-huh. together and then we share our work. So basically that idea I spoke of in the beginning where it's it's art gym. You're training, you're learning by doing. And I think that's a really important concept that a lot of information is good, but really a lot of the learning, the specific knowledge that you get comes from actually doing so you 100%. just need enough instruction to get started, to get to the next step. And then you learn by doing, and then you can repeat that over and over again. So that's one of the things that's paid. Okay. We have the Illo Gil, which is a collective of illustrators that I'm sure we'll touch about a long later. Mm-hmm. And what we have, we start to do now is once a month, we will have kind of like a round table. We'll have a different topic. So a topic might be productivity, for example. And okay. it's a group of authors and illustrators and we'll talk about our productivity hacks and challenges and mistakes. And we'll yep. do that for about an hour. And so the recording of that is one of the things that is paid. Right. And then twice a month, I write a longer guide that could be about how to create a portfolio, how I think about portfolios, or how to contact agents, how to make friends on the internet, things like that. Okay. So that's, that's all the paid material. So do you feel like this is leading to anything bigger than the Substack? Do you, do you, do you imagine, for instance, this, uh, what you're writing for these guides becoming a book, for instance? That's a good question. So one of the big changes in my thinking this year compared to previous years is that I'm building a library. So every single piece that I make is, is more permanent. Previously, I was like writing week to week. Mm-hmm. But now I'm really writing more permanent pieces that I might reiterate or I might expand. I haven't thought of the final form, but I know that I'm building. And next year I'm going to be building on top of what I'm building this year. So that's the the big shift of Substack. Okay. And I think on social media, 
Substack's not exactly a social media, but I think the shift in thinking is really valuable to think about building things rather than posting things. And it's quite a difference. Like you could build something and post it 10 times or create different versions of it. But if you just create a, a once-off post, then it's just gone and you've, you've basically wasted your time at the roll of the dice. Unless unless you hit the lottery. Right. So if I if I've got this right, you're you're talking about consistency. Like you it's 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 not enough to just write one great article or create one good piece of content. Um, it's about having this bigger picture that you're filling in. You're creating this these these boxes, if you will, over time. And you're doing it in a way that they kind of they're they're consistent in format, they're consistent in audience, consistent in, in, in place and all these things. And and rather than this hope that you're going to create something that will get you some lead or some opportunity this one time, you're being very strategic, very deliberate, very intentional. Uh, what I'm getting from everything we've talked about so far is you are a planner, uh, you're a strategizer. And and whether it's your... your um, plan to become an illustrator, whether it's your plan to create a substack and a community and a sort of almost a business model around that, it's all very calculated. Is that, would you, would you agree? Yes. But it doesn't start calculated. I think the the way I think about it, one of my inspirations is how stand-up com- comedians work. So there's two phases. The first phase is like going to a club, doing an open mic and seeing what sticks. That part is mm-hmm. not calculated. So my first two years on Substack was not calculated. The idea was to mm. get on there and just write every day. That's it. So it's just consistency. But from there, you can learn and then you can start to make the next version of that and the next version. So it's it's iterative as well. And there is an element of freedom and chaos but at some point, it has to have a form. It has to go in boxes so you can stack them up. I think it's important to stack them up. And that's what comedians do as well. They stack up their jokes and eventually come up with specials, big shows, things like that. Right, yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you start just by, like, you do whatever, cast that wide net, open mics, um, writing on stage, yep. and then... And then you're figuring out, oh, that that got a laugh. That felt good. How can I tweak it? And then you're then you're putting those into your your set or your hour or your special later on. Exactly. And I, I mean, that's that's another thread that I'm I'm hearing in common around all this. Not just in how you're approaching your career, but also in how you're guiding and and instructing your audience, you have this kind of wide net or this broader part of the funnel, if you will. This is what I'm envisioning. I, I always picture things in like this in terms of there being this funnel or, yep. a, or a, something with a wide end and a narrow end. It has to start at the wide end. Mm-hmm. And you're capturing both the I'm going to call it the hobbyist. That might not be everyone's preferred word, but you're capturing the career-oriented beginner looking to break into the illustration. And then you're also welcoming hobbyists, people who love art, creative people. They don't know if they want to be a career illustrator, but they're interested, like you say, in your world. They They want to kind of get in on it in some way. And at that broad end of the funnel, you are saying you don't need to have a goal. You don't need to have, uh, yep. uh, you don't have to have it all figured out, but here's what you can do. Almost, almost what you should do. Draw for 10 minutes a day, at least do this consistent thing, this practice. That's your writing on stage. That's your open mic. And through this, you start stacking up your the, the little nuggets that are valuable to you, that mean something, that stand out as a clue to what's next for you. 
So do you have any examples of this happening uh, either with your group or with with yourself? I, I've endless examples, I think, because everything I've done has been like that so far. So before I did children's books, I was drawing comics and putting them online. I write affirmations as well. I write, Adam Ming is a world-famous cartoonist. And, mm. and so I did that for about a year during COVID. Well, the two years, there were two phases of that. So a couple of years. And as I was stopping doing that and moving into picture books, I actually got contacted to do a book based on those mm. comics that I've done. So those comics really did stack up. And the person mm. who hired me, they sent me a collection of my comics that they had somehow collected and chosen and said, we want to do a book and we want to do it like this. This is what their book ne needs. And, hmm. and it was a collection of, of my little pieces. And it wasn't just the pieces from the comics. It was the pieces from the comics. Like some of it was from the Instagram comics. Some of it, of it was from my practice which I did as stories some was it some of it was from practice I did for breaking into children's books or another avenue I'm exploring doing live drawings live scribing so that was something I was exploring and all these things were collected by by that designer to give me my first book gig so so the okay. pieces really matter they really stack up Another example was... What is, what is that book called? That's called Where Are You Really From? Okay. I I think I saw that on your website. Is that book already published? It is published. It took a while, okay. but it's out now. And I think it's a really important book, I might add. It's about race. It's about how we come from the same source as race. Mm -hmm. um, it's written in a very funny way for a young audience, so... I think it's a really helpful too. Sure. Okay, where are you really from? That's that's a a, ve a very powerful title for a book. Because you, you hear that, you hear that sort of like, no, like where are you really from? You don't look like you're from here kind of thing. Exactly, that's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it sounds like it's a very deeply meaningful and personal uh, yeah. project for you. That's so cool. So you you were just creating these things for yourself based on something very authentic to you these affirm uh like you well i mean even before that you said you kind of i don't like the word manifested but i'm going to use it as a shorthand here you manifested yep. that you're this um world famous cartoonist you operate as though you were yes you not you know you you are acting you're learning by doing as you as you've said um, I, I would just add to that. It's not just that the only way to learn is by doing. The only way to be is to do, right? The only way to be the illustrator or the cartoonist is to do the thing even before you feel qualified to do it. So you're doing that. You're creating this content for you as a discipline. And, and these are seeds that you sowed way back and it's only like sometimes it's not not until way later that they come to fruition but i mean that's that's an incredible example uh, of this do you have any examples of this um with uh, any of the people that um you would you know maybe as who are a part of your subset community success stories maybe i can't pick any out at the top of my head and I don't know, I wouldn't want to take credit for what someone else is doing, but I can say generally that I've seen that the people who read the Substack and do the things that I've suggested become quite successful in, like the different things that I've suggested have brought them success shortly after I've suggested to do those things. So maybe it's the way to present yourself and your work. Yeah. One of the things I, I tell people, and it worked for me as well, it's not enough to just do the work and put it out there. I think you need to take care of some hygiene issues. For example, if your Instagram is HireMe101 and your website is Cool Bananas and like yeah. everything you do has a different name, 
it becomes quite difficult for people to find you or even take you seriously. So you do have to do things like use your own name in your Instagram profile and use preferably that same name on your domain and things like that. So like these little hygiene things make a difference. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, how would the would the designer be able to find and pick out all my work from all the different places if there was no shred connecting mm-hmm. everything? So that's the that's the boring work that you need to do as an artist and and sometimes people think that now my work is so good they'll they'll put in the work. People are so busy and I think if you really do little tweaks like this, it makes a difference. So I've seen many people who who took that advice, made some tweaks and then very quickly get an agent or get a book deal or just have different levels of success rather than being stuck. And right. I think that is a point. A lot of the times we are stuck by things that we have created, the obstacles that we have created. Like, for example, having Cool Bananas as your domain name mm-hmm. is a kind of limiting factor that we create for ourselves for whatever reason. We choose to be clever rather than clear. You know, yeah. Uh, well, that's that's definitely an interesting point. When people have asked me, you know, should I name my website coolbananas.com or just my name? I'm like, your name. You're always going to be you. You're, what you're doing will change over the years. And yeah. it might be like a bad tattoo that you regret getting if you if you do this. I mean, that that's that's very common sense, good branding advice be consistent, um, have longevity to the names that you're choosing for yourself. Think, think just in terms of what's future friendly. Um, now how would you say any of this, all of this kind of applies to this idea of the, the daily practice that we're talking about that, that like you, 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 you talked about your example of D- doing your c- cartoons daily um that was like your open mic thing and then you you know a few years later you have the book with this designer uh and then and then i guess i guess maybe i caught you off off guard or put you on the spot to see if you had any examples from your uh well, actually your i do group. have an and example now that i've thought about it if you yeah still want to hear it yeah uh, absolutely so early on when I was doing Substack, I did encourage everyone to do a Substack as well. Just to... Mm-hmm. Because I saw the value that it had for me just said it, after doing it for a little while. So I got everyone in my illustration group to commit to doing a Substack as well. And it's hard because maybe someone doesn't know what to write or they're not confident, they're kind of stuck. So an example of what we did, and now everyone in the group has written for a couple of years, is... We would pose a question every month and all of us would answer the question. So you get a diverse point of view from the group. So that's one Mm -hmm. way the group has has started with like little, just answer one question once a month. And just come up with those questions every year. So we have 12 questions a year and we answer it once a month. So that kind of system we put into place. And now everyone has a substack. So while other people are starting in 2024, from zero, they have a backlog, mm-hmm. they have some audience and, and we're connected to each other so that helps us grow each other's audience as well. So I suppose that could be an example of No, it's an incredible example. I love that. Like you're you're really um doing what, what you're hoping, uh that you said you're hoping to do, which is providing value. Like you have that that same story that all sort of creators today have like if you're if you're a little bit ahead of other people or a lot ahead it, people want to know how you got there and the the same story is basically i i did x y and z put in the time and work and then got there and now i have this sub stack that i'm i'm supposed to turn into something that i want people to come back to again and again keep getting value from how do I add that value? Wait, what I see you doing is really, you're you're like a mentor to your group in, in the sense that you're not just you're not just sharing 
your your journey or what you're learning or you know listicles top five things you can do to get started as an illustrator you are really helping them to go deep um and 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 what i love with this question thing these 12 questions and what you said there is you're giving you're helping them create a back catalog of stuff that stack to create their hours hour-long set to to um use the comedy analogy there's that you know yep. you're, you're helping them come up with content that they're that they already have ready to go when they start their Substack. uh have, has Substack? are they aware uh, of your evangelizing activities for them and are they paying you for any of it no <laughs> you you say i'm a mentor to the group but to be honest we mentor each other i kind mm-hmm. of think of it like the inklings with tolkien and cs yeah, Lewis. they it. had a group and it's really helped accelerate the learning and the journey. I think that's a big part of the success that we talk about is having the group because we we share resources. Someone hears about something, they tell it to everyone. If someone's hiring a particular kind of illustrator, we recommend the illustrator from our group to that job. If someone's looking to hire for a particular role, we recommend it to the to the right person in the group. I'll put an open call in the group. And as we learn different things, as we experience different things, as we get rejections, we share with each uh. other what that looks like so that we can all improve. As we make mistakes, we share with everyone in the group so we can all improve and we ask each other for feedback. And it's really like growing 10 times faster. There's about 10 people in the group. So... It is growing 10 times faster Mm. because we see what everyone sees and what everyone's doing and what works and what doesn't work. And we can pick the best from what each other is doing. And it's amazing Mm -hmm. to have another set of eyes on every illustration that you do. You can't do that on social media because the client wouldn't like that. But if you can take the work as far as you can go or almost as far as you can go and get other experts Mm. take a look at it and say, maybe try this, maybe try that. You don't have to take all the okay. advice, but it gives you a lot more range for your work if you're willing to take some advice. Yeah, uh, I, I I personally would find that really um, scary. Well, I I, I, <laughs> I guess I'm I'm intimidated by the the idea of sharing work in progress with ten people and just opening myself up to ten possibly different opinions. Um, this is a whole other thing that we probably don't have time to get into, but I mean, your, your comment about having this group that at present is 10 people, 10 professionals who are invested in one another and, and helping each other grow that iron sharpens iron kind of model, 10, 10 people, you're growing 10 times faster because you're, you're getting it out there. And instead of swirling inside of your head in maybes, you're you're actually hearing specifics from other people. So I think that's yep. that's that's a really important thing, whether it's ten people or one person, that you can get that feedback from. This is about feedback. Uh, that's really important. So just to just to be clear, this is your this is your group that you call Illo Guild. It's correct? not well. Or is that something yes, else? Yes and no. It is my group is in, in that I'm a part of the group. There's no leader per se in the group. I okay. did found the group by by putting out the call and saying who wants to do this group thing, but it kind of evolved on its own. Mm-hmm. I do take on a bit of okay. a facilitator role, but as the yeah. group progressed, um, the roles have been distributed. So someone's the editor of all the substacks. We have our own substack. The Hello Gil has a okay. substack. So we have okay. an editor for that. We have a librarian for all the content in the group. Someone who helps host the meetings and someone else puts up you the a, videos. So a librarian. Yeah, you guys you guys are organized. So but but I mean I mean the point the point of the question, I guess, is Illo Guild is what your group is called. That's not right. your not your you're not the guru, you're not the yeah. you know, the what the Christ figure of the group or whatever. <laughs> you know, I get that. So uh, but but the group is called Illo Guild, and did I hear you say that it's kind of an open call? Like you you welcome possible new members. 
Not anymore. So in the beginning, it was not an anymore. open call. But because we've gone so far, we can't think of a way to add new members to it because the the discrepancy would just be too far. Like what, what we've been through together uh-huh. compared to the new person. It'd be too much pressure yeah. for a new person to say, all right, these are all your responsibilities if you want to be part of the group. I think that would be a bit yeah. too much and scary. So what we have done is once a month, we have this roundtable talk, which is basically the members of the Yellow Guild talking. And there's mm-hmm. an audience, and the audience can chime in, and sometimes we invite them to speak on the various topics. So that's our way of scaling the group. And our first mm. um, talk was actually about how to create your own group so that people can Good. start doing Good. their own. So so we found a way to was... scale what we are doing because we feel that so much mm. value, it feels a bit selfish. And not just selfish, but I feel that things need to grow. And if it's not growing, then there's something wrong and it might start to eat itself. So by doing this public thing, we're allowing ourselves to continue to grow. Oh, for sure. It's almost it's almost like a way of your little feedback group, Elo Guild, yep. getting feedback from the greater world. Like, yep. like it's, it's like everything has to scale in that sense. Like you can't just you, you there has to be some cracks that expose you as one unit one group to the wider world and so on and so on it's sort of fractal yeah um, exactly yeah that's what we're talking about I think fractals we'll be right back the new year is here and that means it's time to check in with your goals and make a fresh start. If you're looking to get to the next level in your illustration career or just trying to get started, it can be so helpful to talk about it with someone else, someone with a bit of experience and someone who can help you ask the right questions. I'm pleased to announce that I now do one-on-one illustration coaching. I've been doing this now since September and I've had the joy of chatting with dozens of illustrators from all places in their career and what they all seem to want is the chance to have thought thoughtful feedback on their unique situation with actionable advice. As a coach, I specialize in making the session about you and I do my best to understand things from your perspective before offering my own. I'm not here to tell you what I think, but to help you discover who you are as an artist. Whether you want a portfolio review, illustration critique, some career guidance, or just to bounce some ideas off of a fellow illustrator, your coaching session is yours to use however you'd like. Coaching sessions are one hour and are held over video chat. For more information, visit tomfrost.com slash coaching. A lot of my success in inverted commas is thanks to you, combination of the classes I've taken. There was a point when I got really stuck. If you talk about this idea of community, I think you were mm-hmm. one of the first people I reached out to. And in a sense, you are already a community that you've been putting stuff out there. You've been inviting people into your ideas, into what you know as a professional illustrator and as so much wealth of content in there. But still mm. at some point, I need specific things and there's no content out there that could give me that. And so I reached out to you personally and you you pointed to some of the things that you wrote, but you even wrote back with with some ideas and that really gave me the next step. So when I felt like I went to the end of my road, I needed to find the next person ahead of me, which was you and... Hmm. I say ahead of me, you're way ahead of me. But you gave me the steps to 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 keep going. So it is that same story of some, of someone coming back and saying like, okay, I've been ahead and I know what's there. So if you follow these steps, you should be able to get there. And so you gave mm-hmm. me some steps and I, I followed them and they helped. So I, Could, I really appreciate that. Well, thanks for telling me that. Uh, c- can you remind me what those what steps I would have told you? There were a bunch Just of them. I think, I think you you gave me like eight or ten bullet points, and oh, okay. I have written about that on my Substack. But one of them might be 
have a separate Instagram account to do something else and one okay. like more more polished one and that was really useful because it's surprising that silly little things like this when you're starting out are big things because I drew something like do I put it on my Instagram account do I keep it for myself but just having a second account helped me like just keep making work and putting stuff out there if it's not good enough for the main account I'll just put it on the the sketchbook account which is now defunct but at that time it was really valuable and the interesting thing was our directors followed the other one okay. they didn't follow the the polished one they followed the mm. the ugly sketchbook and, and that's interesting love it I love it yeah I mean that's that's not everyone's strategy but it's a strategy for um, re- relieving yourself of the um, expectation to be perfect and polished right you have a place where you can let it hang out a bit and be messy and I am actually learning over the years as as I've tried to hone in my style for instance and control a lot of those um, factors that express what I do the more controlled I get the less fresh it is the less Mm. there's something that's that that soul that messy soul is is removed and I think we need to do that. We need to learn how to control ourselves and to uh, be consistent in, cer- in certain ways and not to let it all hang out all the time. But having, I'm, I'm, I'm learning that you can't lose that altogether. You need to have the chaos element. Um, otherwise, it, it just loses vi- the vitality that attracts people in the first place. And that's something I'm, I'm, I'm uh, thinking a lot about these days. But um, I think there's so many little things that, that we've left hanging here. I'm just going to let them hang and move on to some of the more practical hands-on questions that I'd like to answer or have you answer for my listeners, which is, do you mind if I ask how, how old you were when you started uh, illustrating? I think it's an important question. Um... I was 38 when I started to realize that I'm going to be 40. And when I was 11, I declared that I was going to be an author and illustrator. And over the course of life, I had forgotten it. Mm. And I, the realization was that, if, that life happens in decades as well as years. So my 40s to 50s was an interesting decade in that I have a lot of experience but I also have a lot mm-hmm. of energy. And once I get to 50, I might have even more experience, but I might not have the energy to do that much with it. And I would surely mm. regret if I don't at least try to be an illustrator, try to fulfill that childhood desire or declaration. Mm. And so those were the two years between 38 to 40 that I decided I would give it a shot. And what I told myself was, I'd be willing to spend 10 years doing it. I would put aside time and like four hours a day, every single day for 10 years. And if it doesn't work, then I can be satisfied and say, I gave it a good shot. And that was the goal. Four hours a day, every day for 10 years. Yeah. Because like you said earlier, in order to be an illustrator, you have to be an illustrator that's all it really Uh takes actually you just have to put aside the time and do it and then you are it I mean if someone gave if someone says I want to be an illustrator and then Disney says great let's do a book this is the brief that person would not be able to do it if they haven't been doing it for for some amount of time every day they wouldn't be how would they find four hours in a day to do it every day they have to prep for that. You have to. You have to be doing it first, then you can do you it. You have to. If that makes sense. Yeah, I just need to pause. Pause right here, and speak directly to the listeners. Sure. Who might feel a sense of urgency? You might be mid twenties and feeling like you're getting ahead. Feeling like you're getting a late start. That was my case. I was twenty six when I went to art school. I felt like time was ticking, and and so you might feel like time's ticking at that younger age. 
You might even feel like time's ticking because you, you have to choose a college and you're still in high school. You might feel like time's ticking and you're in your 50s or 60s or even older. And here is Adam at 38, uh, almost 40, saying, I'm going to spend four hours a day every day, not for 30 days, not for six months, not for a year, 10 years. Adam has a long game here. And he, I, I find this a very unique and and maybe even I'll say a rare outlook because I think a lot of us say, how do I do this now? How do I get to where I want to go as soon as possible so I can start making a living doing this? How, how have you been able to stave off that sense of urgency? How have you, how, have, what, what is it about you that, that, that you think is totally normal <laughs> to say, I'm going to, I have a 10 year game to be, I'm going to give myself a 10 year window. Uh, I give myself like maybe one year ahead for things like that. So like how, what is that about you that, that makes you think in terms of decades like that? I think a lot of people think that when something, they need something to happen before they can do a thing. Like, I need someone to pick me before I can start becoming an illustrator. I need to go to art school, then I can start being an illustrator. Mm -hmm. If the goal, if like you take pleasure from spending four hours a day making art and having people being able to see it and consume it and appreciate it, and in doing so, make your own art better, you don't really need mm -hmm. another reward. Don't tell that to the clients. They might stop paying me, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a reward in itself to be able to produce something good in in four or five hours, have people see it, get their feedback. That's really what you want as an illustrator. And of course, you need to feed the family and do all that other things. That's what all the other hours are for. So you... Right. So that's, a, that's an important uh, missing ingredient that we haven't talked about yet. What is... What is the thing that's supporting those four hours a day for 10 years while you have a family to feed or what was it? And, 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 and to the, the point of the question is, um, we're not, you're, you're not relying on illustration at first for your living, right? Yep. So what are you, how, 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 what was, what was your, we'll say your, uh, your starting package or, or what gave you that, that, that head start, uh, that you're able to s focus your time. It's not a single thing. It's a combination of things. Um, like for example, family support is part of it. Like because mm -hmm. of family, I have a roof over my head. And so that, that helps. So you don't have to worry about that component of it. But before okay. doing illustration, uh I was, doing startups for about a decade. I kind of got suckered into it, but I'm not going to go into details because then we'll go another meandering. But basically I was in tech startups for about a decade and I came out of that. And the only thing I really uh -huh. came out of that with was a set of skills that were inherently valuable. Things like understanding marketing, for example, or knowing how to plan or manage projects. And so I was able to get jobs that will allow me to spend less time and contribute more value so that I could have time to do this thing, my illustration thing. And then mm -hmm. at some point I got, a, just before the pandemic, I got a pretty good, a couple of pretty good consulting jobs. And so that allowed me to do this. And all that went away with the, with the pandemic, which wasn't really a bad thing because at that time I had a little bit of savings and mm -hmm. nothing else was happening except I had this one trickling illustration gig that's been there for for a long time. It's like mm -hmm. someone I met on Twitter a long time ago and he keeps giving me this work and I keep doing it and I thought, whoa, when everything else is gone, I can still get by with illustration. So what if I just repeat that? Now, it's 10 years since I met this guy on Twitter what if I did the same thing? Like there was a period 15 years ago 
where I was meeting people on Twitter and they were giving me jobs. Hmm. What if I just doubled down on that? That was my strategy. I would put work out there. I would repeat what I was doing 15 years ago. But now with all the knowledge that I have, having worked for in startups for a decade, applying that, and I thought that's, mm-hmm. that's a sure bet to scale up what I was doing, which is a little bit of illustration work, to, to a full years of work. And it kind of worked out that way. Right. So when you were 38, starting in, you know, starting out on this journey, you had that um, spark. You were like, okay, now I'm finally going to f- pull the trigger and and try and be an illustrator. It's, it's kind of like now or never. I have the energy to do it. Um, I'm going to make this 10-year plan. I'm going to spend four, four hours a day. I'm going to support myself based on... Um, uh, Basically, you you had you had a a day job that you didn't quit yeah. right away, right? You were consulting. Uh, uh, maybe at some point we can talk about what we, it was totally unrelated to illustrate uh, like art and illustration, right? It was more it was, would it be have been just generally speaking, it was more like mar- tech or marketing, something like that. Tech marketing, related marketing, yeah. Right, but meanwhile, you're seeing what skill like you, you're building up skills that you knew would be helpful to you in some way regardless um you had one little clue of of a future as an illustrator what you call this one trickling job through a a contact on twitter um i i i have a feeling you we've talked about this before you were doing illustrations what was the who is the client or the company he's a he's a guy named rajesh sethi he's an Mm -hmm. entrepreneur in silicon valley and okay. so I would do little illustrations that for him that he would compile into books or use in his presentations. He gives talks and things like that. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. And that's, that's an, uh, another really important point that I think we should all, like, I think that my listeners should, um, I guess, understand, which is uh, you might have this you might want to start as an illustrator doing some something bigger or more impressive, or you think that your first job has to be, you know, an official real client, but it could just be an individual reaching out to you because they like something they, they saw of yours. And, and it's really important to seize those early opportunities. And it's like, you get this tiny little opportunity and it's your it's your opportunity to make something bigger out of it it doesn't mean that you have to be a grandiose in that job you just do that job well and and maybe they'll ask you to do another one and another one but it's these tiny opportunities these small opportunities that we get that allow that that become the sort of foundation for bigger and better things down the road and so that's one thing that I encourage I guess people that I coach is you may not be getting the the big Cinderella opportunities that you're looking for if that makes sense like you you know you're not getting these these amazing oh my gosh I'm doing it I'm working for Disney or or whatever your dream client is uh, it, you might it might be like making bulletins for your church or um, newsletters for your uncle's bowling partner's dog walker's cousin, <laughs> but <laughs> you're you're looking for uh, these little things that you get to learn on the job. Uh, you might get paid, you might not, and and it's it's really not. It doesn't matter what you're paid or how big the opportunity is. As much as whether you see it as an opportunity and an uh, an opportunity to l- try doing what you're so excited to be, and and basically what your attitude toward that is, and how can you see that as an opportunity that you get to do versus uh, something that um, isn't great and it's not good enough or something like that. We all have to be the judge of what's worth our time. Some things aren't, aren't going to be worth it. We have to make that call, but I love that. Just finding a small opportunity that really becomes, it becomes confidence boosting for you. It becomes, uh, 
a foundation on which you can build skills and people say, oh, Adam's experience, he's worked for this person. They see that you've done professional work. It's part of a, it's a portfolio piece or a whole project, right? Yeah. So. Um, little things build for, up. The little things build up. So, so for people who are starting out, they have a job, they want to transition, maybe they're a designer and they want to become an illustrator. I, I, I hear a lot, a lot of people from that world. Uh, or maybe they're in t something totally unrelated. They feel like time is ticking away. Uh, what is your advice to someone in that position um, to, in terms of like, where do, where do they start and, and what should they do if they want to become an illustrator? I think to begin, you need to sacrifice. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what you want to sacrifice. I think if you can't figure that out, if you can't figure out how to find your four hours a day, then it's going to be pretty hard to to get in. People have been doing it for thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours. They're going to get a job ahead of you. You need to catch up with the person who has that 10,000 hours. And sure, you might get there with just 5,000 hours or 2,000 hours, but you still need to find that those 2,000 hours. And so whether you do 10 minutes a day or four hours a day, you're gonna have to find the time and do it consistently to to build up enough clout and skill to be able to do it. So figure out what you want to sacrifice, build that time, and then just work on it. And I think you can iterate from there, but it's really about having the discipline and that time and that space to work on. And you can start with as little as 10 minutes whenever you can find it, but you will mm -hmm. need to do more sets. You will need to expand right. that. Yeah. So you need to know what you're giving up because time is not unlimited. What can you what can you advise then about what what to what to replace? Like what are you sacrificing to? Sure. We know that it's it's That's easy. We know that it's the big job the big goal is to become an illustrator, but what what are they doing instead of the thing that they're sacrificing? So how to find those hours, I think you're trying to ask. Is, this, is that um, right? Did no, I I'm, I'm saying just like, uh, sorry, I, I, th I might be overly complicating the question, but it's um, you're, you're removing something from your life. That's the sacrifice. You're yeah. saying, I no longer um, watch TV, yeah. Netflix. I'm going to unsubscribe to these things so that I have more time to make. Just for instance, what are they doing in that time instead? That's a great question. I would say start a sketchbook. I think Jay-Z actually says this uh, really well. He says there's a knowing, he calls it a knowing. He says, as an artist, you have a knowing of what you're supposed to make. And I mm. think you would start there. Like for me, it was comics. I knew I was going to make okay. comics. And although that wasn't the place I ended up, that was the place I started. So... I believe yeah. if you even have the desire to make something, you already ha it comes with what to make. I think knowing what to make is not really the challenge. The challenge is having the space. And if you don't know what to make, then have a sketchbook and see what happens, see what shows up and draw something there every day. And if you, you can't do that still, there are tons of books or resources like Actually, for me, one of the things that I that started me going again after being in my startup tech job for a long time was this book called 365 Days of Drawing. It's a thick book. Basically, it's a sketchbook with some prompts. And that's a good place to start. I started doing that for 21 days. And then I thought, I think I can come up with my own prompts. So I didn't need the book after 21 days. But the book got me mm -hmm. started. So okay. you can I, do that. I, my, my daughters have that book. It's a Hardy Grant book, right? It is. It's like a red or a yellow cover to see. Yeah, it's by Lorna yeah. Scooby, who's who's represented yeah. by the same agency I'm in. It was because she was in the agency I, I thought of going with the agency so that it's really fun how it went full circle. Okay, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. So you like we're doing the three hundred and sixty five days of drawing and now you're on the same roster as this. I mean that that's that in itself is a, a sign of success. 
I agree that there is a sense of we we have an inner sense of what we want to do. I think maybe this is this is probably the last question I'm going to ask you. And and it's it's this knowing that Jay Z has sort of I, I I I'm 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 having a hard time getting to the question, but basically, how do you know what the knowing is? Because a lot of people still come to you, Adam, asking, where do I start? What do I do? People come to me and ask me that. How do I start? What do I do? Um, I feel like there's a lot of things that get in the way of us actually knowing what we really want. Because once you know what you want, you're, that's, that's, a, that's like almost everything. Once you know what you want, you just go in that direction and you take on, you know, the the church bulletin job or you yep. start a, 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 a tech startup, whatever it is, you're, you're, you're still focused on bringing those things and converge, help, making all those skills and experiences converge on what your bigger goal is, the thing that you want. So how do you know what you want? What is, how do you know <laughs> what your knowing is? That's a good question. Yeah, and you can answer just personally. How did you know what you wanted, yeah. if that's easier? Yeah. If you don't know what the knowing is, then you go take a job in tech, and you go try to raise some VC money, and you do that for 10 years, and you go for your board <laughs> meetings, and you travel around the world for trade shows, and you spend 15 hours a day on your job and and get nothing in return. Yeah. Do that for about nine years it'll be so clear. <laughs> At least it'll be clear what you don't want to do. Yeah. I, I don't know if that really answers the question, but for me, that was it. It was, it was understanding that there must be a different way to live and what might that look like. And if I want that to happen, what are the steps I need to take and slowly see how people have built lives that are different from what I was currently doing and then try and follow in those footsteps. Like, like mm -hmm. in a way, I'm following in your footsteps. I might be doing different mm -hmm. things, but I'm doing them in the same way after being able to watch what you do. That has given me an idea of, of how to shape. And, and I think it's evolving. It keeps evolving. You start with drawing comics and then it becomes picture books and then it becomes picture books and having a sub stack and it continues to evolve, but you start with where you are and you look at the people who are slightly ahead or, or where you imagine that's where you want to be. And you might be wrong, but I think it's a good place to start. Yeah, no, I, th I, there's just so much in there. So, so you, you, you've put so much thought into everything you've been doing and I don't know how rare you are. I, I don't know how many people are, are as planny as you are and st strategic. A lot of us kind of shoot from the hip and I'm, I'm a little bit of both of those things. I'm, uh, I, I like to schedule and plan and just know what I'm, what I'm doing and what time is for what, but the discipline side comes not so easy to me. Like the like focused, I'm doing this, this is what this small snippet of time is for, but it's a reminder to me, talking to you is a reminder to me of the importance of consist consistency and showing up, uh, doing the thing that is most related to what you should be doing, the thing that you closest to what you know you should be doing, whether that's drawing 10 minutes a day uh, every day, creating something from your heart and banking it away so that, oh, like it, you don't know now how it's going to, um, pan out. You don't know what, what you're going to do with these things or who's going to see it, but you got to do those things and you got to be consistent about it. And I think a really important ingredient too, and I'll just add this as my own observation of you, Adam, is your your passion and enthusiasm and your positivity uh this is the the biggest thing about you that's impressed me that has made an impression on me right from like you uh you um tweeting stuff probably around covid era times that's when i started you know when we started to meet each other and uh, uh 
talk back and forth. Just your your enthusiasm, the the way you would talk about how excited you were about an opportunity to talk with someone or to do something. And that is such an important ingredient is just being all in. And uh, if we can all just get a little bit of your enthusiasm and passion from today's discussion, uh, I think we'd all uh, be better for it. So the last thing, of course, before we end our conversation is I'd like to give you an opportunity to um, let people know where to find you. And if there's anything that you'd like to promote or reiterate from the things that we've been talking about, um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you and, and just to chat. I appreciate that. Um, I have a sub stack. It's now at 10 minutes artist.com that's t-e-n minute artist.com and there's there's really some good free stuff in there that i hope you will enjoy and if you are a bit more serious about your practice i try and give more value as well to try and save you time based on what i've learned and i don't know everything but i can share what i know and if i might add one more thing if you want to get some of my books it's at adamming.com slash books and I add the books that get published as they get published to that. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tom. That's fun. All right. This concludes the first official interview episode of the Thoughts on Illustration podcast. That was Adam Ming. And my name is Mr. Tom Froese. And those were our thoughts on illustration. You can find links to Adam's sites in the show notes. And of course, you can find links to all my things at tomfros.com, including my Patreon, my work, my Skillshare classes, and more. Remember to rate, review, like, follow, tell your friends, and all those lovely things. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. I'll see you in the next one. The music for this podcast was written and performed by Mark Allen Falk. You can find links to his music in the show notes or go directly to his link tree at linktree.ee slash semi-athletic. That's linktree slash semi-athletic.